Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 220. This is the Tuesday, July 31st edition of the show. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. First thing you need to do, go check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. We got everything up there, including all of the YouTube videos and whatnot. So check that thing out. You can get every podcast we've ever done on that site. Do it to it, winningcureseverything.com. Next up, the show is brought to you by mybookie.ag, the best online sports book, the best layout, the best odds, everything out there that you need for your sports gambling. Check them out, mybookie.ag. And for right now, you can use promo code WCE50, that's WCE50, that will give you a 50% deposit bonus. So if you put in 100 bucks, they're going to give you 50 bucks for free. That's always a good thing. Free money is always good. So check it out, mybookie.ag, the best online sports book anywhere, and you get a 50% deposit bonus using promo code WCE50. We have got a lot to discuss today, but first off, make sure, I guess this would be second or third off, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, make sure that you go and, uh, and follow us. Uh, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, all the, the wonderful podcast apps. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. You can follow me at GaryWCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini. You can follow the show at Winning Cures. And you can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Winning Cures Everything. After that, let's get into some news. All right, first thing up, let's jump into the blurbs today. There's a lot to discuss, not a lot of huge stories, stuff that we could make their own segment, I guess you could say. Uh, but a lot of stuff that, that we just want to kind of touch on. And we'll, we'll jump into a lot of other, a lot of other things later. Uh, first up, you know we're big, uh, we're big Brett Bielema fans. Correct. He was named the consultant to the head coach for the New England Patriots. Now, explain to me, Chris, what does that mean? I think, I think this is a probably a really high-quality internship. Is this like a Butch Jones at Alabama no, kind of thing? No, no, no. Those are <laughs> – one guy is getting coffee. The other guy is learning how to coach in the NFL. So, basically, what you were talking about is is Bielema could end up taking the OC position whenever – Well, you know what he could also do? So this is one thing that because I'm an insane Patriots fan and and I follow this team closely, they have and this is this is an undeniable fact. They have the greatest offensive line coach in the history of football, and he's he retired at one point in time. Bill called him a couple of years back to come back. He came back. Uh, he'll never leave New England. He wouldn't coach for another team. He's from there. He lives up there, but he is an older guy. Brett. Is a former offensive lineman. Brett used to run the the offenses from the offensive line at Wisconsin. I could easily see maybe not an OC job, but Brett sticking around, learning the Patriot way, and eventually working his way into that offensive line position in New England. Okay, so either OC or offensive line. Either way, he is going to have a, a spot OC, eventually. OC would be dependent upon how well him and Josh McDaniels mesh because he he wouldn't get the OC job unless Josh moved into the head coaching job and Bill retired. Yeah. Yeah, that's there's a lot of ifs there. Yeah. Uh, there's look, there's some crazy stuff that has been going on in New England this offseason. So But I definitely I definitely never think never. this is this is him learning a the NFL way, the Patriot way of doing things and I mean, he's made it clear, "Hey, I don't have to recruit I don't have to kiss 18-year-old kids' butts. And <laughs> and I get to go to work, and I get to worry about my players doing football all day. Yeah. I don't care if they're making it to their chemistry class or if they're able to pass Algebra two. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You just care about football. It's kind of – it's a lot different. It's a lot different. Uh, next up, Nick Saban went on ESPN and – at media days, he told everybody that he didn't know if Jalen Hurts was going to be here next year. Well, then he came on ESPN a few days later and said that Hurts told him that I am going to be here. I came here to get an education and to get my degree. Hurts will uh, graduate in December. Does this change anything at all about the current situation? No, no, it doesn't change anything. And here's the reason why. We know he's going to be there this year. 
because if he was going to transfer, he would have had to already transfer. Teams are already in the camp. Yeah. So there's no question. Well, he would have had to sit out this year anyway. But if so, he waits until he graduates, then he which doesn't will have to sit in out December, at all. Then next year he can go wherever he wants to go. So yeah. this changes nothing. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. I think it's really smart of Jalen to graduate as early as possible so he can play an extra year of football because we both kind of agree unless he changes position, this guy is not Lamar Jackson. This guy is not Deshaun Watson. He's not going to play quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. So he needs to play as much as he can because it could be the last time he plays. Yeah, I agree. So don't sit out a season, get those plays in, graduate, do the right thing, and I'm for that. But there's yeah. no doubt he was going to play this year. That's he, Well, he here's the thing. He can't transfer today. We're too close to the season start. Well, he wouldn't transfer today and be able to play anyway. Yes. The reason I bring it up, like Blake Barnett transferred from Alabama after like four games back in 2016. Yeah, but they're not the same guy. One but, guy but, took a team to two national championships. I'm with you. I'm the with other you. guy's name is Blake Barnett. But what I'm saying is nobody wants Barnett, that like Hertz is the one that, that beat out Barnett. He was ranked lower as an incoming recruit or whatever, but... Barnett left after four games in the middle of a season, and that season counted as his redshirt season, like his uh, his, transfer his, his transfer season. season. Yeah. So Hertz well, could it, it could counted. feasibly leave by like really the first couple of weeks in September, and this would be his transfer year. We are having a completely different conversation though, because Hertz is three months away, four months away from graduating. That, Agreed. Blake Barnett wasn't close to graduating. Well, on top he, of that, he'd have been on campus for for five minutes. If Hertz loses the job, do you think that Saban would keep him? Like it, he would only allow him to play in like four games. Like, because you know, Mac Jones is going to be your backup. Would you only let him play in like three or four games so that he can use a red shirt, so that when he is a graduate transfer next year, he would have two seasons? Oh, by not playing him a lot. Yeah, playing less than four games. Um, a, I don't think. Or would this I, be something where Saban plays him like in five games anyway, just so to, that if he goes to Auburn or Tennessee it, it or wherever, not, it would not shock me for Nick. I'm, I think Nick is going to do what's best for his football team. I agree with that. So that I, that, I don't think he's going to a do Jalen any favors, but I also don't think he's going to actively hurt him if if Tua goes down. And and he needs a quality quarterback to come in in a tight game, and yeah, it's going to blow gonna, his. He's going to yeah. blow his red shirt. He's going to do what it takes to win that game. Yeah, I agree. Because it, and I'll tell you this: as much as I hate on Alabama, as much as, that's the right thing to do because you have to take care of the. T- you're the head coach. Yeah, you take have care to look of the out team. for the team. You can't look out for one. Now you want to do what's best for as many individuals as possible. Yeah, but you have to put the team first. I agree. Next up, Arizona quarterback Khalil Tate's tweet may spark a revolutionary change in the NCAA. This was a Bleacher Report article from last week. The deal was when Arizona was looking for a new head coach, Ken Neomatalola, hopefully I said that right. Navy coach. Navy's head coach. For everybody who doesn't know that name. Was the hot name. Runs the triple option at Navy. Like, that's what he does, etc. Khalil Tate, you would think, would be really good in that offense, you would you would think, just based off his rushing ability from last season. He right? would be. And so, here's the deal, though. Khalil Tate jumped on Twitter, and he, he put out a single tweet. Now, this is how he explained it. He said, when I tweet, it is something important. He said, I download the app, I tweet it, I delete the app. He said, and then I don't ever look at anything else. I just I tweet what's important. That is a, that is a wise young man. Yes, what he tweeted was, I didn't come to Arizona to run the triple option. The president and the AD saw it, immediately contacted Kevin Sumlin, dropped Ken Neomatalola off of their list, and the AD basically came out afterwards and said, yeah, like the, and the president came out and said, look, we want our student athletes to be involved in these hiring processes. We want them to be uh, to approve of who they're going to be playing under. I totally get that aspect of it. My question to you is, should big-time universities be focused on the current student-athletes, or should they be focused on what is best for their university? Like, I don't know that, that Ken Neomatalola was better than Kevin Sumlin. Okay, that's but, a different question, yeah. Yeah, different question altogether. But if they thought he was, would this one player 
have the the power, even though he's only going to be there a couple more years, to to completely submarine a hire. So, Should they? So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer I'm gonna answer both questions, even though we're not really asking the first one. First, I, I like <laughs> Ken Nien, Nien, Nova Pot- Ken Nien. Yeah, you got you got that. <laughs> I've totally butchered that guy's name. My apologies greatly. Um, and and, and I, I like him a lot. I love watching Navy play. I you know I oh, bet God. we bet on them a lot. Yeah, no, and, we do. And, and he's we're, a spread we're, cover yeah, machine. We're we're definitely big fans of his. Whew. But for major power five football, I I think Kim, Kevin Sumlin is kind of leaps and bounds better. Well, Khalil Tate came out and explained the reason why is that he has more of a chance of getting hurt. Oh well, yeah, but he in wants that play, he wants to play on Sundays. Yeah, he wants to. He, he, he doesn't can. want to get hurt in in like playing at Arizona. That kid can. And I, he I think he can. It, and I, and I he's got to he's got to yeah. figure out how to throw the ball well, a little we, more. We can handle that. But Kevin Sumlin, you be taught to be able to do that. You be taught that. You would think so anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um. So 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 that answers question one. Here's the thing. Question two: As should big time programs be doing this? We got to define big time programs. Power but, five programs. Well, okay, but there's a uh, difference. Right, you know, screw that. No. Any program. Any program. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. Any college football program. Should yes. they listen to the current student they, athlete? They absolutely should because the current student athlete, the quarterback playing today is not a whole lot different than the quarterback that's going to be playing there in four years. And what you want to, to know is that what is the, the young generation right now? You and I have become old guys. <laughs> what does the young generation right now want more than anything else? They it, want their voice to be heard. Oh, that's – yeah, you that, are so they, right about that, that. That is that is not arguable. Very, very that's nice. That's what they want. And so, simply, this AD and this president has – so now Arizona is not playing with USC and Oregon and Washington on the same level of recruiting. They're Agreed. just They're just not. Now, hey, I, I might I might go look there. You know what? I don't know that I like what's going on here, and I'm not a fan of this quarterback or coach, and and Oregon's changing coaches every couple of years. I, you know, maybe Arizona's not so bad. And and, and at Arizona, guys, I know that they'll listen they, to me. They're at least going to listen. They might not do everything you say, but they're going to listen. I like. And it. you know what? I'm totally okay with it. Now, if you're a not Power Five, you're a big boy conference uh, team playing for national championships every year, your Clemson's, your Florida State's, your Ohio State's, your Michigan's, you know, your Alabama's, your your legit big boys, you, Oklahoma, USC's, the Blue Bloods? Yeah. No. They have to look out for the greater good of the entire university and the and the legacy that those teams are carrying on. I don't think Notre Dame can do this. I don't think I those teams that I named can do this, but but could Memphis do this? Oh, oh yeah. Absolutely. Could, could could smaller schools do it? Yeah, but even if you've could, got a guy that that is could a Missouri Heisman do this? contender, absolutely, Missouri then, could yeah. do this. Their power. Well, five Missouri SEC already did it. But yeah, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like I actually think that matters because the kids about to be recruited, that's a big deal. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right, we got uh we got a couple more. Uh, Danny Green just traded from the Spurs to the Raptors. Came out on his podcast or on a podcast uh, last week and said that he played with a groin tear that was undetected by Spurs medical staff. Does this give any credence to why Kawhi was uh, hesitant to come back for the Spurs? I'm not going to get too much into this. I don't know, and I also don't. It probably does. That'll be the answer. I but find it funny that he that he started talking about it after he got traded. Why this did, guy was a he was yeah. toting the company line like. Yeah, he, he, he would have never he, said a word. He waited until he left. I kind of respect that. Yeah, but but also, I agree. Here's my deal. I don't now. I'm not not a doctor. Played one when I was little. But <laughs> it, how on earth is a trainer supposed to know you have a tear unless you tell him I have a problem in my groin? See, now I don't know the full I, story, so but I don't, I, I don't but know. From that. what I understand. He had told them. He reported, "I'm having, yeah. I'm he having." He told them, "I'm having problems. problems," and they looked at, "Oh, it's, it'll be fine." Yeah. And then he played anyway. Okay. Because he didn't want to upset the team. That's like, right. I, and I get that. But either way, that, I thought it was very interesting that it, one, he waited till he left, and two, that's two different instances that people have had problems with yeah, the there, Spurs medical there staff. There could be a little smoke, and Danny Green's never been like the diva guy that that uh, 
Yeah, he he ain't been complaining. No, I mean we we never. I was about to say that Kawhi's been, but that's a shot at Kawhi, and I shouldn't do that because Kawhi's pretty quiet and to himself. Yeah, and really, he never came out publicly and said like his people, I guess, did or whoever. But like he never said, you know, that anything was was majorly wrong. He just he just wanted to get out of there. All right, last up on the blurbs, there was a man that was exercising naked at Planet Fitness. He thought it was a quote judgment free zone and it should be that's what i was gonna ask should this man have been allowed to exercise naked in a membership place swing like, that thing man <laughs> swing that thing get some power cleans in absolutely absolutely all right I got, I got no beef with it i've never been afraid of a dangling nah me either me either where where did this take place let me let me find the location on this and see gonna, what we're dealing I, with now now over under on wagering is it Florida? The guy's name is Eric Stagno. He's 34. Happened in Place Style, New Hampshire. Happened in New Hampshire. Oh, oh, God almighty, we got advertisements abort, everywhere. Abort, abort. Either way. We got, we got the fighting to Either way, New Hampshire. One. <laughs> fighting to remain number one. <laughs> Thanks, Fox News. <laughs> we appreciate y'all. Good gracious. All right, let's move off of that. It's time for our SEC West preview. <laughs> All right, it is time for our 2018 college football SEC West preview. Now, last week we did the SEC East, so go back and listen to that podcast, watch that YouTube video, check it out, tell us what you think. Um, quick recap. Should we give a recap of that or just tell people nah, to watch it? let's just roll. We'll let everybody roll with it. All right, so let's do alphabetical order again. Okay. Is that cool? Sure. Uh, we'll start out with Alabama. Um, let's see. Alabama has... The number da, 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 number 10 toughest schedule in the SEC. It's number 48 in the country, according to Phil Steele. They have got the number 7 uh, SEC experience, like as far as uh, whatever, which is also number 50 in the country. They lost a lot last year. I mean, 12 guys got drafted. Uh, I think another 9. No, no, no. They had 19 overall that are on NFL like practice rosters, rosters right yeah. now. So, yeah, they lost a lot. Uh, but they do have a lot coming back, so that's good. Uh, percentage of uh, offensive yardage coming back, 76.9. That's number 34 in the country, number four in the SEC. And their offensive line starts, they are number two in the SEC, 103, which is number 15 in the country. Yeah, they've got a veteran offensive line coming yes. back. That's And that's always been the that's bread and butter big, of Alabama offense. Big for them. Yeah. Big for them. Uh, their over-under is 11. I have them going over. So that's undefeated. I've got them twelve and zero this it's year. The only way you can do that. I, I think the schedule is uh, a little bit easier. They play at LSU, they play uh, at Ole Miss, at Arkansas, at Tennessee. They got Louisville in non-conference. I don't see like maybe I loss. I could see maybe at LSU if things got crazy. Yeah. Night game in Death Valley, kind of weird. Um, but I've got them twelve and zero. What you got? I got them nine and three. I just, I just don't see in, – in a lot of this is hate. But, but at the same time, you know, you can only spin this wheel so long before, you know the last time before it in, begins to fall. You know the last time an Alabama care. team lost three games in a season? Uh, when y'all lost to Utah in a Sugar Bowl? No. Oh. 2010. Lost to Cam Newton's Auburn team. Lost to LSU on the road. Lost to uh, – uh, at South Carolina when Steven Garcia had like – I do remember the greatest that game in the yep. history of the world. Yep. Love that <laughs> so, team. Steve Spurrier had a team. That, I'm telling you, but people, let's go back to Georgia for a minute. People underestimate playing at South Carolina when that place is jacked up. Yep, man, that is a real yep. SEC next, venue. Next year, come hell or high water, I'll I'll be there. That's yeah. We I, we need I to really go to hope, Columbia. I, I really hope they continue to roll. But next year, I'm going to a South Carolina game in Columbia. All right, so you've got Alabama at nine and three. Got where, at nine and three. Where are the losses? I don't, I don't, I don't do. I mean, just that, just kind of give me an I, idea. Here. Auburn is really. They went into the Plains last year and they got their butt whipped. They didn't just lose; they got their tail beat by Auburn. Okay. Okay. It, so so they could lose the Iron Bowl pretty easily. That is a coin flip game. All right. Okay. They've got I, Mississippi State at home. I think A and M's going to be good. I think LSU's going to be okay. But here's the deal. LSU could lose every SEC game this year and beat Alabama, and it wouldn't surprise me. It just wouldn't. 
game. Uh, what what is the SEC slogan? Game, it just means more. Yeah, like, yeah, that, this, yeah. That's right. It, it's LSU just, always plays Alabama correct. tough. It is always a, and a if, grudge and match. If, and if you think that, and I know they don't have the guys, they don't have the dudes at all to beat Alabama. But if you don't think Jeremy Pruitt's going to have those boys at Tennessee ready, they've been waiting for a decade to beat Alabama. I'm, yeah. I'm telling you, it, would it's, it it's shock It's been me? 11 years. Uh, aside from the fact that you were a fan, would it shock you that a new coach taking over a dead garbage program for a long time that used to be heralded and historic, would it shock you if he came out and said, this is a trash can game. We are throwing everything at it. Because I, I could see LSU being the same way. I could see LSU being 6-6 six and six or something and saying, Alabama's coming to town. We win in this one. We we might lose to Troy. We might lose to Rice. We're winning this game. I okay. Cuz I see Tennessee could do the same thing. I could see that with somebody like you know when Hugh Freeze came in or if Lane Kiffin came in to like LSU or wherever. Like if you had an offensive minded coach that is doing something that Saban hasn't seen. But Saban has never lost to one of his assistants. That doesn't matter. He has no. never lost that, to Tennessee just, at Alabama. I just don't see that, that this that, year. That never lost to an assistance thing is a is a is a bullcrap argument that I don't care anything about because a most of his assistants he a doesn't have to play them every year. Rarely do they go to the West. Well, so, now so now he's, he's got to play Jimbo and well, Jeremy right. Pruitt every year. So 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 he doesn't play them often, and so, he might have to play Will Muschamp or Kirby Smart in the right. SEC championship game again. So like, there's more now yeah, than no, there was. There are, there are more. But, that number is going to change eventually. Yeah. And, and would it would it shock me if Pruitt does? And the fact that you you put so much credit on the offensive side of the ball, I just think that's foolish. I think it's foolish. I love defensive coaches. I I think all these athletic directors hiring only offensive staffs. Jeremy Pruitt's a legit head coach. He's going to be really good. You win games playing hard nosed defense. That's just how you do it. I, I, same reason I argued for months and months that Bill Clark should be in the Power Five program. He is a defensive mind, and that's the reason people don't want him because they want some young, hot shot offensive guy. One day, Bill Clark's going to get a Power Five team. He's going to build a defense, and he is going to kick people's butt. I'm not afraid of a that. defensive coach. We have spent like five minutes on Alabama. We can move off of them. Now. You asked the question. I know I did. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. The, the chances of them going nine and three are slim and none. Okay, but I, I think. But it's going to happen eventually. Eventually, this mountain is going to begin to crumble. That doesn't mean it's going to fall. It's just going to crumble. You can't win the conference every year. Didn't win it last year. You can't win the championship every year. It's just going to happen. Yeah. All right. I can understand that. Uh, let's move on to Arkansas. Okay. I've got them going six and six. Uh, seven and five. We're not a whole lot out. I actually yeah. like this hire, and I like this team. I'm excited to watch this offense. Um, the thing that concerns me about Morris is he brought over all his staff. And From SMU. I don't think, though, because you are qualified to coach at SMU, I don't think equates to the fact that you're going to be a great coach. So, So I think he is good. But bring in your defensive guys, and those guys haven't schemed against well, they, SEC boys. Yeah, don't forget, they've got uh, John Chavis no, as they defensive did coordinator. Cha- okay, yeah. never mind. Yeah, so, do I, but, but a lot of the other assistants are the same. The problem that Chavis, I've got with Chavis them is, guy, though. is they, like they don't have people that can recruit right now. Well, not right now. But winning but, will take care of that. But if they and, win, it'll take care of that. And Jerry will take care of that. And Tyson will take care of that. And, so, and Walmart will take care of that. I've, I've got them going 6-6. Six and six. I've got them uh, I'm losing at Mississippi State, losing to LSU, losing to Ole Miss, which they could easily win that game. Yeah, I was about to say. That, that'll be a high-scoring game, I'd imagine. If, it, if, if there's ever been a team that just had somebody's number, Arkansas goes to Oxford, and those games are cra- – if you could bet overtime – Bet that it's going to go to overtime. Yep. Whatever the spread is, take the dog because it's going to be a tight game. It's going to go to a field goal or an extra point. And yeah. and Arkansas usually comes up on top. I don't see where they was can it fourth I, and thirty four. Yeah, I know it was crazy. At fourth and twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah. So, uh, look, I don't see him winning at Auburn. I don't see him beating Texas A and M. I don't see him beating Alabama. Ole Miss. I've got them losing, but they could they could easily win that game. Win that game. Yeah. 
Uh, LSU, I've got them losing, and then at Mississippi State, I've got them winning they, at Missouri. They they could they could easily win any of those games, and they could easily lose any of those games. I mean, I, I just think, I, I don't think, think they, they got the dudes. Middle of the pack SEC team, and I think they're going to wash out six and six or seven and five. I don't think I, I couldn't see eight and four. So they they went four and eight last year, um, you know, and they're moving from a power offense to a finesse offense. That's so right. we'll see what happens. Uh, Auburn, I've got at nine and three this okay. year. Uh, they were ten and two last year. Uh, Auburn over under. We didn't talk about Arkansas's over. Oh, under. we didn't talk about Arkansas. Arkansas's over, over under. under is six. I go. I would go over. Auburn's over under is nine. Mm. I've got. I've got them dead on it. I've got them at ten and two. I think. I think I like Auburn a lot. And so you've got Auburn beating Alabama, right? Yeah, I've got Auburn okay. beating. I mean, I just it's a coin flip game. Give me the dog. That's just where I'm probably always going to be at. Uh, Do you have them losing to Washington? I don't. I don't have them. I don't have. You just them got them ten to. I, I got I'm them sorry. ten to. My bad. So, I, and I, I, I look at each to, game, and I don't mean to do that because I know if I look at each game and I try to figure out will they win this game, will they win that game, so many of that doesn't work out the way you think it does, and it skews my point of view. But I think there's going to be a stretch where they're you know they're going to have to play Auburn and Georgia or Alabama and Georgia. Those Both are two on the road. really hard games. They're going to have yeah. to play LSU. LSU's going to play Auburn tough. They're they might not win, but they're going to play them hard. Um, and so you know, it's an oblong football. It bounces funny. Sometimes things go you know strange ways. I like Auburn. I like the way they build their team. They build it with defense. They build it with running the football. It's, They've got a good schedule. It's the way I've always loved growing. I am going to actually enjoy watching them play all, uh, Washington though. That's good. Chris yeah. Peterson. Is a genius. He really is. So, like he's he's awesome. We'll, we'll get into him later. Um, let's see. So it, so their schedule, Auburn schedule, is there's no body blow games, right? Like there's always a break before they play one of the good teams. So like before LSU, they play Alabama State. Before Mississippi State on the road, they play Southern Miss. Before uh, like they play at Mississippi State, then Tennessee at home, then at Ole Miss. But then see, they, they could they could easily lose two of those three games. Yeah, they could. Like they that, could. I mean, that that that's um, the SEC. And then you've got a bye week before they host Texas A and M. So the toughest stretch you got is a two game stretch where they host Texas A and M and then they play at Georgia. That's and that's a brutal schedule, man. Yeah, that's, that's tough. That's tough, but that's, that's I mean that's nothing games. compared to some of the other ones. All right, so let, it, talking about tough schedules, let's talk about LSU now. God. All right, they were nine and three last year. Uh, LSU has got the toughest schedule in the SEC. It's, yeah, it's number 10 close. in the country. It's not close. It's 10 uh, in the country. Yeah, 10 not in the country. Not in the SEC. Uh, number one in the SEC. Yeah. Uh, their experience, last in the SEC, number 129 out of 130 in college football as far as returning experience. It's going to be hard. Um, only 17.1% of their yardage comes back. Uh, they've only got 35 offensive line starts. That's number 119 in the country. And their over-under is seven this mm. year. Now, they do have some dudes, but they did lose a lot of juniors that left for the NFL last year along with some seniors. Yeah. So, let me get your record first, and I'm, then I'll tell you mine. I'm going to give you my record that I'm going on record with, and I'm standing with this. You can, you can put some truths to memory and ask if I believe it or not, but I'm giving them 9-3. and three. Giving them 9-3. and three. I have them at... Six and six. I think you're closer to the right than I. I and and look, I some of these that I have them losing, they could easily win, right? I don't know. You use the, the, the word ones, easy a little loose right now. Uh, well, okay. I don't know that At, any game. Look, it would I, it surprise you if LSU beats Florida? Or if LSU oh, no. beats, uh, no. it, it, all right. So Georgia might be different, but they're playing them at home. Let, like let me they've tell got you Georgia this. and Alabama at home. I'm about to talk some noise real quick. Give me right. give me one second to talk some noise. Go ahead. Okay, we're. We're going to beat Florida. He might lose a lot of games. LSU might lose a lot of games. Orgeron might look like a bumbling buffoon. We're going to beat Florida. Why do you think they'll win at Florida? I, I think Florida is trash. I think Florida is absolute trash. That's why. Okay. They got okay. like nine kids arrested this week again. Yeah. Come on! I man. think they'll all be back in time for that game. Though. I don't that, care. That let game's them come in back. October. Let them. That's fine. Let so. them all. Let them all come back. That's right. Here's, that's the quality and character of players that I want to play against. Let me. Let me give you the losses that I've got. I got them losing to Miami. I got them losing at Auburn. At that point, like at once you get through September, I've got them at three and two. They'll beat Ole Miss, beat Louisiana Tech, beat Southeast Louisiana. 
Then I've got them losing at Florida, losing to Georgia. I've got them beating Mississippi State, which could surprise some people, but, I, you know, I think they got better dudes. Yep. Uh, losing to Alabama, beating Arkansas, beating Rice, and then I've got them losing at Texas A&M. I think that that's a game that Jimbo is, is circling. No, none of that would shock me, but the fact that they are going to have to play Alabama, A&M, Georgia, Florida in the SEC – is just obscene. Yeah, that's it, that's out there. We we have to do something with these like connected teams for cross conferences. They should rotate both teams to where maybe once in twenty years you'll have to play two of the top teams in the other conference. Well eventually we can talk about that. Like we, we may hit on that next week because uh that's a big thing that Saban's been on. He wants a nine game SEC schedule. So if you've got the one traditional rival, then you're swapping out the you know two other ones. But I don't think so, you should have the traditional rival. Why? Why is it that they can't ever rotate and have the one year where they get Vanderbilt, Kentucky, and Missouri once every twenty years? Like why is yeah. that never that that can never happen the way it is set up? I'll, I'll tell you this uh, in the in the nineties. Or early 2000s, when Alabama had to play Tennessee every year, I was thinking the same thing. Right, but Tennessee's been garbage for 15 years. Well, Florida's been kind of garbage for a little while no, they, now. They, 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 they haven't been garbage, all right? They haven't they've been, been garbage. They've been decent. They've No, they've been good. They've been hard to beat. They've been well, yeah, a good they, team. They make a really, they've been top 10, top 15 almost every year. Last year, they were trash. Yeah. Now you're right. You're because right. they had trash players. Guess who they have this year? Trash Same players. trash player. Dan ain't gonna clean up the program. All right, let's let's do Mrs. Uh, Mississippi State. Let's go on to that. They were eight and four last year. Uh, look, we'll we'll do all this. Mississippi State, uh, the fifth toughest schedule in the SEC, number thirty-two in the country. SEC experience. They are the number two most experienced in the uh, conference and number five most experienced in the country. Uh, their offensive line starts. 76, that is uh, dead middle in the conference. They are tied with Arkansas for number seven, uh, and that's number 51 in the country. Their over-under is eight and a half wins, which is pretty out there. Give, uh, me, the, give me the under. That's what I'm doing. I've got them at eight and four. I've got them at seven and five. Okay. I've got, them, I've got them winning at Kansas State. I've got them beating Florida. They'll start out five and oh, I think. But... Losing to Auburn, losing at LSU, losing to Texas A&M, losing at Alabama, I think they go into Oxford and beat Ole Miss this year. Yeah. All right, so let me tell you why I don't think they beat Ole Miss this year. I'll actually tell you I, I'm picking that game right now. Okay. Because Moorhead is not a Southern boy. Moorhead could care less and has no history to what that rivalry means. He you might, don't think they'll explain that to him? You can explain all you want. If you don't live something, you can teach somebody about something all day long. Well, Dan Mullen wouldn't. Throw him in the fire. And Dan Mullen didn't beat him and for a while. And then once he got here and he realized, and then Dan started poking fun and poking the bear and he, he, he got it. He realized give, what, what give ignites him a, his family. Give him a couple of years. But Moorhead, it's not about. He knows this game matters. He knows it's important to everybody else, but I believe in, in, in real, genuine things. I don't think you can fake certain things. You can't fake enthusiasm about something you're just not excited about. And the fact that Moorhead has never thought about Ole Miss as a school in his life, he all of a sudden can't fake. He can't have real hatred for them today. He yeah. just can't. No, it's no, no, going to be I'm another game, and everybody on the Ole Miss side are Ole Miss boys. Now you're right, and and, and as, while I have opinions about what I think of Matt Luke as a head coach in that program, they live that that that's going to be their Super Bowl. That's going to be their championship. Let Let's go on and move on to that. Let's move into Ole Miss. Ole Miss went six and six last year. Uh, they have got the number eight toughest schedule in the conference, number forty six in the country. As far as SEC experience, uh, they are number nine in the SEC as far as experience, number sixty three in the country. And their offensive line starts, they are number three with 102 right behind Alabama. They're number 15 in the country. Their over-under is six. I've got them dead on six again. Yeah, I got them six and six, too. I don't, I don't think they're going to be great. I don't think they're going to win a lot of SEC games. Well, that's the thing. I've got them six and six, but i got them two and six in the conference. I think yeah. they beat Texas Tech, you know, that Southern Illinois, Kent State, that's right. whatever. But wins at Arkansas, at Vanderbilt, 
but I mean, I probably should have done that. I probably at least could have done an overall record and then an SEC record, and that would have given you a truth, a true feeling of, of, of how what, I think yeah. about these teams. Because I mean, everybody's got three cupcakes, and or they're playing a tough game, but they're not really tough. Now LSU's got a legit tough game. Mark Rick's probably one of the best coaches um, uh, that that's going to be competed against and best teams. Um, so yeah. All right, let's uh, let's jump off Ole Miss. Uh, wait, what, what what was your record? Six, six and six. six. We're both okay. six. six. Uh, Texas A and M. And I got a steak dinner that they won't go nine and three <laughs> with a boy Kurt. <laughs> That's I forgot about that. No, I, I ain't gonna forget about that. Texas A and M. They went seven and five last year. Uh, they are. Let's see. Texas A and M has got the number two toughest schedule. Number fifteen in the country. Um, da, 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 Texas A&M number four as far as the SEC experience goes number 29 or sorry 22 in the country and offensive line starts they are number five with 96 that's number 29 in the country their over under is seven I've got them at eight and four I think that Jimbo is uh, a better coach than Kevin Sumlin is at least down there um, I think he can take what they've got and really pump it up I, look lose to Clemson lose to Alabama lose uh at South Carolina, at Auburn. I think they beat LSU for the first time since they've joined the conference. I think they're 9-3. and three. I think they're really good. They're going to compete with Auburn for the SEC West. I like it. I like it. 9-3. and three. Wow. All right. It is time for the ranking. Now, every week we do this, we'll keep explaining it so that everybody understands where we're going with this. Uh, the ranking is a draft. We have got our own lists. Each of us has a top ten. And this week, we are drafting the top ten best active college football coaches, not named Saban Meyer or Dabo. You can't pick those three. Okay. We already know that everybody loves those those three coaches. Mm, We're, I don't know that they make my top ten. Well. <laughs> None of them. All right. All right. So, it, it, did you go first last week or did I? Oh, you, you went first last week. I went you first. Tom. I'll let you go first. All right, so I will go first this week. Number one on my top ten best active coaches is Chris Peterson. He is 129-29 and 29 with a .816 winning percentage. What he did at Boise State is remarkable. Look, Boise was, was already good. Like, they, they've had a slew of, of good coaches that have gone on to bigger things. But what he did completely changed that entire program. And then what he has done at Washington so far, look, he took a program that that really, look, under Tyrone Willingham, who had success at Notre Dame and all these other players at Stanford everywhere else, Tyrone Willingham went 0-12 one year over there. Like, he, he wasn't able to win. Steve Sarkeesian, they were congratulating him on, on seven and five teams. This guy went... 11 and 1, 12 and 1, won the Pac 12, got to the playoff a couple of years ago, went to a, a, a New Year's Six game last year. I love Chris Peterson at number one. No, absolutely. He's really, really good. He's on my list. He was not my number one, though. My number one is the crazy, psychotic, unpredictable pirate himself, Mike Leach. You like Mike Leach over everybody, everybody else? else? If you told me. I could have any coach in the country to coach my LSU Tigers. I would literally push everybody else now, off the boat and claim him captain. Now, why Why is that? I, why? Just, I, I like his quirkiness. I like the way he coaches. He coaches hard, man. Yeah, he does. That guy takes nothing for granted. He puts it all out there. Sometimes his players absolutely hate him. But everything he does, he truly believes is making them better. Okay. And it's and he's not afraid to be unconventional. He's not afraid to just he's break a, he's every norm. He's willing to try everything. Is. Yes, he's he's there is no box for him to think in. He he's he's as outside of the box as it can be. I believe that is where great minds live. I believe that's where great success usually goes because of his quirkiness and is so outside the box. No major team will ever give him a chance and I think that is a shame. I think if he could play with LSU, Ole Miss, Alabama style players, quality talent, I think he would wreck college football. All right, so we've seen Mike Leach in two different places. We've seen Chris Peterson in two different places. Number three, 
I've got Chip Kelly. Now, we've only seen him at Oregon. It, even in the NFL, he was successful for a time. Like, this guy... It, it, oh, in the NFL, successful for a time. Every year he had a winning record. Well, other than San his, Francisco. His, San Francisco, oh, he went yeah, like 1-15. I, I don't right? even so, remember that he was in San Francisco. So, well, he was only so, there for a year. But um, his, his days in Philly, he made the playoffs. He took yeah. a garbage team. To the playoffs. He won like 10 and, games. And, and you want to talk about somebody unconventional? Yeah. Like, he was not scared to cut the best player on the team. and Correct. whatnot. If he didn't flow with what they wanted, That's right. then he knew, gone. He knew Shady was a piece of trash. I'm not going to say that Shady's a piece of trash until we hear everything right. that comes out. He but could easily not be. He could easily not, not be. But, because it, especially after the Reuben Foster stuff, right? He, he um, is suspect. Chip Kelly was 46-7 and seven in just a few seasons with a .868 winning percentage. Yeah. Like, he, no, look. crazy good. We'll see what he can do at UCLA, but imagine what he could do at UCLA with the talent that they could get in Los Angeles. I, I don't know. See, this is where we differ. I don't think UCLA can recruit any different than Oregon. I just you might don't. be right. I think like, with here's the resources that Nike brings to Oregon, everybody they can forgets. recruit like anybody else. Everybody forgets that Chip Kelly had NCAA problems because of his ties to, you know, the seven on seven coaches down in Texas. So Willie Lyles got him in a whole mess of trouble down there. But look, the guy understands you got to cut corners to win. Like, you got to figure out ways to get players we, into we your program. We all know how the sausage is made in college yes. sports. So, and Chip Kelly gets it. Chip Kelly knows how to win. Like he took Oregon to a national championship game. That's right. Now, and, and he set them up for years afterwards. That's right. He, so, he was able to leave, and lesser coaches could continue to win there. Exactly. Number four, my next guy up, Gary Patterson. Now, this, nice. this, this might be my favorite stand. Mike Leach is a little crazy. A lot crazy. I like that he's crazy. Gary Patterson is the model of consistency, and I just I think he's one of the best coaches in college football. I, I would with absolutely do anything to have this guy run a program that I love. My my number three on here, which will be our number five. You know, I'm going to skip him for now. I'm going to skip this for now. I'm going to move on to uh, my number four guy. James Franklin, if you can win at Vanderbilt, like I know that you can win at big-time programs. He is in a conference in, in a division That's right. that is big boys. comparable to the SEC West, and he has won the conference no, already. That, that division has been over the last couple of years better than the SEC West. Yes, in, in, in recent times, absolutely. Ohio State, Michigan, With, Penn Wisconsin, State. Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan State. Ohio State, and Penn State well, are better but, than everybody Wisconsin's in the SEC. not in their division, but they're in the, oh, that's right. yeah, they're they're in the same the, conference. The, the other three are better than all the SEC West teams not named Alabama. Yes. Consistently the last couple of years. Yes, I, I agree with that. But James Franklin, he's 60-32 and 32 overall, a, uh, a 65% winning percentage. Look, the guy is awesome. If you can win at Vanderbilt, in my mind, you can win anywhere. So, props to that. James Franklin, I got at number five. Number six, my number three guy, Jim Harbaugh has to be on this list. Jim Harbaugh took over a an academic uh, – the, the equivalency of Vanderbilt in Stanford. Stanford hasn't done anything since John Elway played there. And – he takes that over. I, I wish Harbaugh had a, had more success at Michigan national, so far. Now, that's garbage, man. You don't realize how bad a program Brady Hoke left that place. It takes time to take over someplace that has been completely decimated with talent and problems for a decade. Brady Hoke went 10 and 2 like the year before he got fired. It, I'm telling you that team like you did you don't not, think that James Franklin taking over Penn State in the shape that they were in like it, and he won a Big Ten championship the in three that they years. Won. Bill O'Brien cleaned that place up, not James Franklin. Bill O'Brien cleaned that up before okay. some Franklin got there, and Bill O'Brien left left that place in a super cush situation. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll so, give you that. So don't question me on the Big Ten now. <laughs> I like the Big Ten. I follow Big Ten football. Okay, Woo, all right, come on all now. Right. Um, but now I. I think Jim Harbaugh is one of the – we criticize him because he has to play Ohio State, Michigan State, Penn State, and and beat them every year. And if he doesn't, he's a failure. Those are three of the best programs in the country. Nobody in the country beats those three teams or any caliber of those three teams 
every year. Alabama hasn't beaten three teams as good as Ohio State, Michigan State, or Penn State every year because they don't play those teams. Uh, and know, nobody man. in the SEC has been that level of good. They they, okay, so they, they don't play them in the regular season every year. But, I mean, my gosh, like – Clemson, well, in the uh, national championship, but I'm Georgia. talking about to get there. You don't, you didn't play, you didn't play Georgia in the regular season. No. You didn't play Georgia in the SEC championship because you didn't make it to the SEC championship. No, I'm with you. I'm you with played you. Auburn, you got beat by Auburn. I, so, I understand where you're coming from. So that it, that we don't not. It used to be a big deal because it was Texas A&M, uh, uh, LSU, Alabama, right. and those you schools know. just aren't the same anymore. They're yeah. just not. So to knock him for not beating those teams, and and let's remember how bad that offense was. Oh yeah, he's he's two crazy plays away from beating Ohio State That's and true. Michigan State and making the college playoff his first year. That's true. His first year. So this ball bounce is funny, and sometimes it's going to bounce against you. And that was with a garbage offense that he inherited. I mean, just a trash offense. Well, he's had three years to clean it up. So let, let's see what he does this year. Uh, it, he's supposed to be the quarterback guru guy, but he hadn't been able to find one. Let's let's see what Shea Patterson does. Uh, next up for me, look, I, I'm going to go on and throw him in here. Uh, I think Kirby Smart knows what he's doing. I, I've got Kirby Smart at number seven. He's 21-7 and seven in, in two seasons. He's already made it to a national championship game. The guy can flat out recruit. He is at a hot spot for recruiting. So if you got the guys – then if you can teach them, if you can coach them, then you're going to be pretty successful. I'm not going to knock Kirby. I, I spent all last year knocking it. I just don't know that you can make a list like this. We're talking about top ten active coaches with one year under your belt. Well, he's got two. But, uh, okay. You know, so, so like let's, sample let's, size is okay. pretty rough. Let's cut Kirby you got smart. An, you got another dude on here that I think doesn't belong in the top 50 best coaches in the college football. That's – Different, but that's okay. Let's let's toss out James Frank or let's toss out uh, Kirby Smart. Okay. All right, we'll pick, move pick on. A, pick another. You get another draft pick. I'll jump in with mm, Sam. So go ahead, do it. All right, I'll say David Shaw. That's just such a garbage pick. That's not a garbage. And you pick. got him fifth. You got him fifth out of all your coaches in the country, David Shaw. I think that David Shaw understands how you win football games. He, you run the football, he, you stop the run. Took over a program that Jim Harbaugh left just obscenely grossed with talent. And every year that Harbaugh's guys have left, every year he has progressively gotten worse and worse and worse. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's every year. Like, look, he So, is, one year he went, like, ten games. The next year he won nine. The next year he wins eight. And the next year he wins nine again. And so, that's a bounce-back year. That ain't a great coach, man. Look, he David Shaw. He plays in the Pac-12 where he, nobody is good but three teams. He's 73-22 and 22 with a 76%, well, almost 77% winning percentage. What's his last two years? His last Just two, two years. Give me two two years. Let's see. Hold on. Hold on. I'm pulling up. I'm pulling up. All right. Here's what he has done. 11 and 2, 12 and 2, 11 and 3, 8 perfect, and 5. Perfect. All those tw- guys here at Harbaugh. So now his fourth year is his first year with all his guys. Okay. Fourth year he went 8 and 5. Okay. Then he went 12 and 2. Got it. And he won the uh, the back 12. Got it. Then he went 10 and 3. Got it. And then last year was 9 and 5. Okay. I think he's good. I, I just don't. I don't. I don't know I how just, you could disagree with David Shaw. I just don't. That's crazy. I don't think he's good. I don't, crazy I don't, talk. I don't, I don't respect it at all. Like, you, you got Mike Leach at the top of this thing, Mike, and Mike you, Leach, you're going to say that David Mike Leach Shaw, doesn't even get to play close to the talent of David Shaw. If Mike Leach could take over at Stanford, oh, my God, he would look, destroy the Pac-12. So, he's been there for seven seasons? Is that right, seven? Yeah. He has won the Pac-12 North in five seasons. Okay. You got Jim Harbaugh ranked before him, and Harbaugh's finished third. In two seasons. In three. Three okay. straight years. Okay. So. But but you're looking at small sample size. I'm looking at whole careers. Jim Harbaugh was, was five seconds away from winning the Super Bowl with Colin Kaepernick. All right. You, you do have a point on that. Like, like, you're talking about coaches, right? Right. You, you're looking at little resume, and I'm looking at everything they've done as a coach. I understand where you're coming from. But I, what I'm saying is, David Shaw, even after all of Harbaugh's guys got gone, 
Harbaugh is the one that taught David Shaw how to how coach. To coach. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. He's just not as good. He's and, just okay, not. Okay. And there, there are 20 coaches in the in the conf, in the country better than him. They just are. I just don't buy that. So I I don't. Anyway, look. Uh, let's see. We're going to disagree. My next coach up is is I've talked about him earlier today. It's Bill Clark. I think Bill Clark is one of the best football coaches in the country. I think this guy is a defensive genius. I think he knows how to coach college kids. I think he knows how to get them to buy into a program and believe that they can beat anybody, even when they are not anywhere close to the caliber of the kids across from them. I think if he had the chance to coach real talent and not UAB talent that went a whole year without a football program, in essence gave themselves a death penalty because of Alabama, like – this is this is just ridiculous. This guy is one of the best coaches in the country. He's one of the best coaches in the country, and I got him this far under Jim Harbaugh. This far. I'm not going to disagree with Bill Clark. I like Bill Clark. Uh, number nine for me, Jimbo Fisher. Now I love Jimbo. I had to think a long time about this because he went 27 and one with Jameis Winston, and. In college, Jameis was one of those transcendent talents, yeah, right? Like correct. he the second year they came back in like seven games. Like they were they were down in the fourth quarter and came back to win. And then they just got obliterated by Oregon and, and Marcus Mariota. Uh that was Mark Helfrich's team. But look, either way, Jimbo Fisher as a head coach, he's eighty three and twenty three. That's a seventy eight percent winning percentage. That is way up the ladder. Uh he is one of only four guys right now that has a national championship. You got Dabo, Saban, Urban Meyer, and then Jimbo. How we don't have Jimbo Fisher higher on this, like I, I think well, the Jameis Winston thing is – I was going to say, w- without Jameis is a is a legit knock. Right. He didn't so make my top ten because that's a that's – a re- I look, don't like so he's 83 small and, sample sizes. Right. Just because you do something really good with a transcendent player, I mean – well, if we looked at that, like then Gene Chizik would be one of the right. greatest coaches That's right. ever, he, right? Because he went undefeated because he got Cam Newton, and then all right, look, Jimbo he's is fired. he's eighty three and twenty three. So take away the Jameis Winston stuff, and he is what fifty six and twenty two. That's right, which is not nearly it's as not high. Great. It, when you in college football, where it's set up for the big boys to go eight and four or nine and three every year. Then, then you can't have a losing record of uh, uh, the winning percentage the, that he has without J- uh, Jameis. So. Right, right, All right. So Jimbo so, Fisher at number nine. He wouldn't have made mine. All right, I'm going off kilter because I've got a few guys here that I like. We'll talk about them in the honorable mentions. But if I've got one last guy to give, I'm giving it to Justin Fuente, and I think that people in the SEC better buckle up. This guy has done. You great. mean the ACC? ACC, yes. Sorry. This guy's done really good things, and um, I think that program is just going to get better and better. He's just getting his feet wet. I think they're going to be good. I think they're going to be good this too. year. Like oh, I, I, I don't know about this year. I think uh, oh. they, they could. Uh, well, you know, we're going to do an ACC preview. We'll, we'll figure that out. I, I don't know that they're going to be great this season. I think the schedule kind of sets up against them a little bit. But we'll I'm we'll not, get to. I that. don't care about schedules. But I, I, I do like coaches. Fuente. I think that he he leaves very strong foundations on programs and he has already built a good foundation there yep. so yeah there's a lot uh let's let's talk some honorable mentions um look I'll, I'll read off the three of mine that i that i didn't name so it kirby smart we threw out he's only got two years small sample size uh scott frost two years small sample size i i still think he's going to be really good but we'll got see it. yeah uh pat fitzgerald at northwestern I love him. I think if he was anywhere other than Northwestern, he'd be getting a lot more pub. I, I think he'd be a lot – like, he'd have a lot more wins. He's 87 and 65. It's 57% winning percentage. Oh, you percentage. can't look at winning percentage when you're looking at smaller coaches. But, smaller but even school still, coaches. Like, look, if you've been at Northwestern for that long and you got 87 wins – Oh, it's big. Like, that's that's good. And he's got some big boy wins, too. He's got some trophies on his on his uh, desk for, for some for some heads. He's killed. Uh. Neil Brown at Troy. Uh, he's on my list. And so uh, he's twenty five and thirteen. The Smart, fact, it's only three years. The but, fact that Neil and Bill Clark didn't didn't get jobs last year make me hate the college football system. Yeah, I just I just despise it. Those guys should be at big boy programs. Who else have you got on honorable mention? A guy that I love, and his program is getting 
getting trashed right now, and it's a hard place to coach. Mike D- Mark D'Antonio is is one of the just ultimate football guys that yeah. I have grown up. My enti- I feel like he's been coaching there my whole life. He uh, um, he understands how to win games, and and I I just like the way he goes about coaching te- his teams are always a hard knock are they ever great no are they ever going to finish in the top two or three of the, of the country probably not but that guy is a guy you don't want to coach against I mean, the guy's already made a playoff with michigan state like that's yeah that's no they're rough big. and then we we cannot do a top 10 all-time co or active coaches right now without having the flying mullet my god <laughs> on there. you just can't have it that guy yeah a can coach some football and he's a football dude I got more football guys on. I care more about how you. I don't know. I think. I think I care more about certain things than wins and losses necessarily. I don't care about that. I, if I don't believe in you being a football guy, you just don't get to make my list. I okay. I'm with that. I'm with that. All right. So that's gonna wrap it up. Let's do the top ten real quick. Uh, Chris Peterson, number one. Number two, Mike Leach. Number three, Chip Kelly. Number four, Gary Patterson. Five, James Franklin. Six, Jim Harbaugh. Seven, David Shaw. Eight, Bill Clark. Nine, Jimbo Fisher. Number 10, Justin Fuente. All right, song of the week. This is Living Part of Life. Eric Church. 2007 Sinners Like Me album. Uh, look, I've loved Eric Church since he since he started. Um, he is he's a fantastic entertainer for one. Like if you've never seen him live, you need to go see him live. He's great. Uh, first concert that my daughter ever went to. Dylan uh, got to see him when she was two years old. It was it was on this tour. He played at the Walmart parking lot in Olive Branch. I remember that. They were doing like a CMT or CMA Fest, uh, Road to the CMA Fest thing, him and Craig Campbell. Um, But, man, I saw him at the the Gibson Lounge, I guess it was, way back when in Memphis. I I saw him open. First time I ever saw him was opening for Leonard Skinner at Snowden Grove Amphitheater down in South Haven. Um, I've seen him at a bunch of different festivals. This dude went out and worked his rear end off. He is a fantastic songwriter. He is a showman. I mean, the dude is a country artist, and he played like ACDC and Pantera and all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. It's it's a show, and it's fantastic. So, Eric Church, Living Part of Life. Go check that thing out on the playlist over at the website, winningcureseverything.com. <sighs> Let's jump into the hot takes. Saturday Down South put out a story about 10 games in the playoff era that did not matter at all. And it struck me as a little odd. So my hot take for this week is, yes, every single college football game does matter. Here's the 10 examples that they used, all right? UCF's entire 2017 season. 2017, Auburn's loss at LSU. 2017, Georgia's loss at Auburn. 2017, Clemson's loss at Syracuse. 2016, Penn State's win over Ohio State. 2016, Washington's loss to USC. 2016, Michigan's lost to Iowa. 2015, Michigan State lost to Nebraska. 2014, Oregon's home loss to Arizona. And 2014, Ohio State's 14-point home loss to Virginia Tech. Now, they didn't even mention Alabama's loss to Auburn last year or Oklahoma's loss to Iowa State, etc. But look, Gene Stallings, former Alabama coach, used to say this. If you don't think the small games are important, see what happens when you lose one. The deal is, because these teams did not lose other games... That game still mattered, but if they had lost one more, if they had lost something else, it set up differently. These games set up rankings and set up things to be like to go forward, right? All of them but one. Every single loss sets up what may happen the next week. All of them but one. Which one? The entire UCF season. Look, the we can get into that later on because or actually is that going to be your hot take? No, it's not that, my hot take. No. Okay. No. Okay. My day's not even football related. Well, we'll talk about something like that in fact or fiction. But it, look, the deal is UCF, I understand they didn't lose a single game, but they had the number, even after playing Auburn, they had the number 72 strength of schedule in the country. Not Nobody, to mention, uh, we're going, let's go down this road then. How many teams do we know that they tried to schedule that wouldn't play them? 
because Memphis in that conference had a game scheduled this coming season with Mississippi State. Mississippi State saw Ole Miss come into Memphis two years ago, get that tail whooping sent home. They saw uh, UCLA come into Memphis, get that tail whooping sent home, and immediately picked up the phone and said, uh, we're buying out of this contract. We're not coming to Memphis, and we're not playing you at all. Thanks. Goodbye. I think, I think and they, they are. Find, and no, they, they are find, playing them next year. And they go find a high school team. They're they're going to play them next year, but but, but, but not this Mississippi year. State is going to play at Kansas State this year. Yeah, but so that's the deal. But no, but hang on, you can't. Why can't they play both? One's not even a Power Five team. Why are you scared of non Power Five teams? Well, one because it makes you look bad if you lose. <laughs> because because it makes you look bad if you lose, and you don't want to lose. So you want to make easy schedules. I just don't like it. I don't like it one bit. I still, I still they can't say control their schedule every, because they can't control other teams allowing them to go play them. Every single game matters in, in that, college football. It here, does. Here's what, because they, it sets up the the placard. It sets up whatever for everything else. So Alabama losing to Auburn set up Auburn to be number two in the playoff ranking when they played Georgia the next week. Like, had Auburn not beaten Alabama, it would have been Alabama and Georgia. And then at that point, do you have Alabama and Georgia playing the first round of the playoffs? Or do you have Alabama uh, no, beating Georgia? No, because if Alabama beats Georgia in the SEC tournament, then Georgia's now got two losses. And they're knocked out of the playoffs. And they're knocked out of the playoffs completely. That's what I'm saying. Every game matters. That I, I, It here's sets up something else down the road to make it – like, Auburn's lost to that, LSU. That whole every game matters thing – has got to be one of the dumbest philosophies of trying to claim a champion I've ever heard in my life. We care so much about games against high school teams or or non-important games early in the season in August and September that it makes things that happen in December and January not important. And that's what I don't like. That's something that I – it's another thing that I hate about college football is September matters so much – that it doesn't give a damn what you do in November or December. You I win see, all those I don't, games. I don't necessarily buy that because Ohio you, State, even though they lost at or they lost at home to Oklahoma last year, even if you lose to Oklahoma, if Ohio State wins out, if Ohio State's name but, is not Ohio State, that doesn't happen. Gary, see you. You forget that the only people that get exceptions to these are these big blue blood schools. Hold on. And everybody let's, else let's look gets at treated differently. If Ohio State beats Oklahoma last year and then Oklahoma loses to Iowa State like they did, does Oklahoma still get into the playoff at 10 and, or 11 no. and 2? No. Does Ohio State then get into the playoff even with a 35 point beatdown at Iowa if they've only got one loss? Yeah, because they've only got one loss. That doesn't mean that game doesn't matter. They only lost one game. That's what I'm saying. But the game two years matter. Ago, two years ago when Ohio State lost to Penn State, okay, and Penn State got left out, they reference this, and, and Ohio State got left let in. Okay. Ohio State got let in strictly because they're Ohio State. I swear before and there's no way to know this because well, we can't go back, but there's absolutely no chance on earth. Any other school in any other conference would have gotten left out if their name's not Oklahoma, Alabama, USC, Notre Dame, Ohio State. Like, that's just it. Clemson's probably now in that window now. But but that's just it. We live in a world of the haves and the have-nots, and Penn State's been a have-not for the last decade. And so, you know, they're good. They're LSU. They're, they're up there. They're in the conversation with the big boys, but they're not Ohio State big. And okay. so, therefore, no, 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 you you still play at the kitty table. You go sit over there. You don't belong here. I think you're jumping into a different section than what I'm talking about. Like, I, I am – I don't care that every game matters. I wish December <laughs> mattered. I want a 16-team playoff. And if that means August and September doesn't matter, I don't give a damn. You, you want that to matter more at the end because of the season. Because I want to play sense. it out on the field. I want UCF – to be able to get in there and say, UCF, you're the littlest guy at this table. You get the 16 seed. Congratulations. You get Clemson number one. Go beat them. Okay. And if they beat them, then we all shut up. And if they don't, oh, well. We had a great tournament. Yeah. No, you're you're right about that. So I, the fact that every game matters 
is one of the most pointless arguments I've ever heard in my life that I we care about college football every game mattering. Let's uh let's see if we can find what the uh what the CFP ranking was. Do you remember uh I don't I don't even know what the CFP ranking is. Well, I was just curious about you were talking about a 16 team playoff. Um Oh, that's what I did. 2017. Oh yeah, you're looking at 18. We don't have that yet. I'm quite certain yep. that Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State are in it if we have a 2018 one already. Yeah, I'm sure they probably are. Let's see. College football polls and rankings for week 16 of last year. Here we go. That's uh, that's the final rankings. That's not what I wanted. We need week 15. Bam. All right. So, uh, what we had was, number one, Clemson would have been playing number 16, Michigan State. Perfect. That's a that's a fun game. Nobody's going to be upset. Number two, Oklahoma would have been playing number fifteen TCU. Ooh, Oklahoma better have that Got butt clinched. Hold, hold on, no, 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 because Oklahoma beat the crap out of they. They yeah. would have swapped up the rankings on this. It would have been like Oklahoma and Notre Dame. So we'll put Notre Dame at number fifteen. They're number fourteen. Number three, Georgia against number uh, fourteen TCU. Number four, Alabama against number thirteen Stanford. Number five, Ohio State against number twelve UCF. Number six, Wisconsin against number 11, Washington. Number seven, Auburn against number 10, Miami. And then USC and Penn State in a rematch of the Rose Bowl. How, how would that not have been unbelievable? Every college football fan in the world says, hey, give me that. Yeah. Give me that right now. Give me that. I'd take it. Can we do that right now? Can we do that for 2018 how, right now? How mad would you have been that LSU was number 17? No, we, we don't deserve to be in that conversation. I have no problem so, with so that. So then does Michigan State, Notre Dame, TCU, Stanford? No, I, I don't care. Here's the deal. It, it, I'm not going to play this. If we make it 16, somebody's going to want to make it 20. No. If you don't make the top 16, you just get left out. Okay. And if the 16 seed wins the national championship, I'm not going to say, well, LSU was 17, and had we got in because of politics, we might have won it. Yes, we might have. But we couldn't make the top 16, so I'm not going to be upset about that. Okay. But you know what I am upset? We got an undefeated team that didn't even get a chance. And when they got a chance to play somebody, they beat the crap out of them. They didn't just beat them a little. They well, beat I mean, them they, a lot. They beat them by a touchdown. But they dominated the entire second half of the football game. Yeah. no, They, they, they controlled every statistical category there is to control. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They dominated the football game. All right, so my hot take still sticks. Uh, people may tell you otherwise, but the bottom line is every single college football game does matter. What's your hot take? My hot take has nothing to do with football. That's all right. Right now, I'm living in a glorious time in sports, <laughs> even when football is not playing, <laughs> because I love this Boston Red Sox team. My hot take is this. 182-game season. We're halfway through the season. They got the best record in baseball, and it's not even close. We record this on Sunday evenings, and and this past week they're playing out of their mind. They might not lose again. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm yeah, just so telling your you. Your hot take if, is that the Red Sox are not going to lose again. If something crazy <laughs> happens, just know that you heard it here first. This team might not lose again. Mookie Betts, he could easily be the best player I've ever watched in my entire life. Hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm looking it up now. I'm going to see what, what they did today. Oh, Jackie Bradley Jr. made a play in the outfield that would make old school uh, David Jones. What was that dude's name? Is it David Jones? Who was the, the – Andrew, Andrew Jones. Jones for the Braves, who was like the best center fielder I've ever seen in my life, make like diving catches. He made a play into the wall today. Nobody in baseball could have made. Nobody. He is the only player that could have caught this ball, and he did. And the pitcher is standing there just in complete awe, saying, "I, I that was an that was an easy stand up double." All right. So yeah, three zero. Yeah. Okay. No. They're, they're just they're hitting when they need to hit. They're they're hitting home runs at an obscene rate. Everybody <laughs> is doing just amazing things. I love 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 this team. I just love it. The thing that upsets me most is Rafael Devins, the uh, the third baseman that's a stud young kid. He's on the DL, but it's 10-day DL. He should be okay. But uh, I love this baseball team. When When is the last time they lost a game? 
Uh, they lost a couple of nights ago. They were in a, a series battle and they won. With three, who? three or four. Uh, it might have been Minnesota. They're playing Minnesota now in a four game series. They might have won, lost one of those four. Okay. On yeah, on Thursday they lost uh, two to one. Yeah. Yeah, All right, so but other than that, they uh, let's see, they beat the Orioles. Uh, there, no, the Orioles it, beat them. What's their overall record right now? Let's see, Boston's give overall me the standings. record, give me, and then give me the Yanks' record. Seventy-four and thirty-three is yeah. Boston. No, oh, that's good. That's, that's a lot. Of that's way on up there. They're, the Orioles won't win seventy-four games all year. Oh no, that, not a chance. No. Not a chance. I mean, uh, a, the Yankees are sixty-seven and thirty-seven. They they are almost ten games better than the Yankees. And think about how good the Yankees are. That's pretty far out there. That's pretty far. Out there. I, where, where are we as far as standings go? Uh, we're, I mean, we're getting close to the end. You know, the season uh, ends. Well, no, no, no. I, I got that. I'm. Uh, let's see. Boston's got the best, uh, best record in the American League. They got the best record in baseball. And it's not close. Oh yeah, it's it's not close. It's not close at all. It's not close at all. Seventy four and thirty three. Whew. And we still got two months to go. You realize brother. they're thirty seven and nineteen, like away from home. Yeah. No, they, it don't matter where they play. This team. Pitches well, plays unbelievable defense. They might be the best defensive team in the league, and they can hit with anyone. The uh, the best, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. The best five records in baseball are all in uh, in the American League. In the American League. Oh yeah. Oh, that's not that's not a question. That's crazy. The Indians, the Astros, and the Yankees, I know, are all, and I don't know who the fifth one would be. I have kind of jumped off because you know I'm a Cardinals, Cardinals fan, and, and they're struggling. They are. Uh, they are definitely doing that. They're 53 and 51. They fired Mike Matheny. Yeah. Uh, all right. So yours is uh, the Red Sox may not lose again. <laughs> that, that, they're not going to lose again. You want a hot take? I got a <laughs> Skip Bayless hot take for you. The Red Sox may not lose Red another Sox game. Might not lose again. Well, in, in that same vein, <laughs> the Cardinals may not win another game. Hey, well, so nah, we'll just lose. see what happens. Yeah. We'll we'll go from there. All right, uh, we'll close up shop with uh, with Factor Fiction. Next. <laughs> All right, it is my week for Factor Fiction. We're gonna close up shop with this. Um, all right, so there's a couple of different stories that, that popped out this past week, both from Yahoo Sports, and they made, like, big national uh, news and whatnot. Uh, the first was how the AAC TV deal could impact the future of college football rights. The second was uh, Dan Wetzel's how cord cutting can change the entire landscape of college football. Cord cutting, look, we've been talking about ESPN and whatnot for a couple of years now, about how many subscribers they're losing and blah, blah, blah. They were at a hundred and. 10 subscribers or 110 million subscribers they're down to like 85 million which is still huge yes um but they have we've we've got all these different conference cable networks that bring in so much money so first thing we'll touch on is cord cutting can change the entire landscape of college football um before we get into the the factor fiction um the big 10 network is in trouble because their 10-year deal with Comcast is up. Comcast is the biggest cable provider in the country, and it is especially big in the Big Ten footprint. So when the Big Ten Network debuted, it jumped onto the basic cable subscriptions, and you get you know about a dollar, almost a dollar, from every cable subscriber in that area. And then it got tossed onto all these other cable subscriptions, across the country, like in secondary markets. Well, Comcast now is wanting to take that off of basic cable and move it back to a secondary package. So for anybody that, you know, has a basic cable subscription and you have to buy like the sports package, that's what this will be on. And the deal here is if they cut that out, how much money is that cutting out from the Big Ten Network? If enough people cut out will the Big Ten Network still be able to survive? And that's where all of this comes in. The AAC TV deal is up next year. It, it, they start negotiating in February. Now, the rumors across the board are that Facebook, Amazon, uh, not Netflix, but you know, Twitter, streaming, whatever, streaming, services. streaming services, and then HBO is possibly looking to get involved in live sports. The, the deal is... You can advertise. You can, like, you draw in a crowd because 
people don't really DVR games. Nope, it's all like, live. It's all live. So Sports you've got an engaged are the one live thing that you can't watch later. You you have a very engaged audience with live sports. So the AAC's TV deal when they first joined in was with ESPN. It was after the Big East had broken up. All this. It was a seven year, one hundred and twenty six million dollar contract, which is pennies yep. on the dollar. Where where Ohio State and Michigan and, and whatnot made about fifty million dollars off of TV last year because of ESPN, Fox Sports, whatever. Teams like Memphis, UCF, uh, Houston, whoever made two million dollars off TV last year. It's a lot less than fifty. Yes, way less. So it it You're completely that, chops man. that out. Now, if you've got Facebook and whatever jumping in, that, look, I've pointed this out on the website before, WinningCuresEverything dot com. Uh, I've pointed it out that UCF and South Florida and Memphis and blah, 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 blah all had very similar numbers at different parts of the year compared to the power conferences. Like, their their brand is getting bigger. The problem is, as their brand gets bigger, the cable footprint gets smaller. So the amount of money that places might be able to put into it, Fox Sports, ESPN, whatever. That's another thing, by the way, about the Big Ten Network. Fox Sports 1 has been cut from basic cable back to secondary stuff again because there's just not enough people watching it. So the deal here is can Facebook and Amazon and whatever or ESPN or whoever, like maybe ESPN with their ESPN Plus package, which is all streaming, can they offer enough money to make the AAC relevant? That's where this whole thing gets crazy, right? My fact or fiction is this. The current TV climate will force the NCAA to split the group of five and the Power Five conferences into two separate divisions. Fact or fiction? I'm going to say fiction. I think all these schools are going to find a way to continue to do business the way they have. One, they have this glorious thing called free labor. That is true. And How long and is that so, going to go, though? Uh, but if that changes, other people, advertisers will be paying for that. That's a thing. So the schools aren't going to pay for it. And then also, just like everything else, when money gets tight, when people are fat and they're living with these fat budgets, they spend money on things they don't need, they don't have to have, but we're big and we're rich and we just buy it. And that's what these schools are doing. Okay? Yeah. And, and now... What will happen is all these analysts that are former coaches or are big name guys and real football guys will go back to being GAs. And, all right, it's as part of your work study program. And we're going to give you twenty grand a year. That's that's a big difference than a couple hundred thousand a year to some of these big uh, name guys that are doing yeah, it. Big time. So, so I think nothing will change other than the schools will have to adapt. The athletic departments will have to adapt. So I don't think we're going to get separated um, I do think we're, we're always going to have the haves and the have-nots that we have now. I don't think that's going to change. Um, but, but along the, the – the, I, I have a statement that I firmly believe is true. The first conference that goes to streaming instead of a standard TV package, at the end of the 10 years, when it's all said and done, they're – the money they will generate will be more than any TV deal has generated over a 10-year span. Now, does that go the same for the group of five conferences? Or yeah. I think, I think if the you think AA, there's enough fans. Because, yeah, think of the, the AAC as the perfect model to do this in. Because while Memphis is in the hotbed of the SEC country, Everybody around here still supports Memphis and wants to watch Memphis games because they want to be relevant in the conversation. Think about the cities that the AAC is in. Dallas, Houston. Houston Cincinnati, alone, Houston Tampa. alone is bigger than every SEC town combined. If you take the entire SEC and all the cities of all the SEC schools are in and you add their population, I bet it's not as big as Houston. I mean, if you throw in Nashville. No, like, Nashville's the only outlier because 
Vanderbilt's in Nashville. That's, that's what I'm saying. And Vanderbilt <laughs> doesn't count. And you're like, but Vanderbilt doesn't, they're not a real SEC they're not, program. They're, <laughs> hang on. Let's be careful. They're an original founding member, and they got the best attorneys. They're never leaving. That's true. So, And we want them. They pull our academics up. Uh, <laughs> but, but think about it. You're talking about Memphis, Houston, Dallas, uh, Tampa, Philadelphia, Connecticut. Like, the Northeast has a ton of people that live there. Yeah. Like, we don't think about my, it because they're little. But my question is, like, are there enough people that care enough yes. to do it? Yes. But all the issue the sports, that you had. All the sports fans there will absolutely pay for whatever the subscription is. The reason that the realignment stuff jumped in was that the reason it all happened was so that you could get more TV sets. Correct. Because but what TV you were doing are going the way of the dinosaur. And I know. If you think but, in ten years, hold on, TV's going to be around. No, the way I understand it is now, that. You're but wrong. The deal is, people are now only paying for what they actually consume. How many people would actually consume this? College football fans. I, I don't fans think it's nearly as big as you think. College football fans will absolutely pay for it. College football fans will, but how many of them are there? I think like there for the smaller team. I think there are plenty because those small teams are in big cities and people want to be engaged in what's going on in their local town. Damn. There are there are non football there are non football fans that I have friends of that could they couldn't tell you anything other than Alabama wins a lot and Ohio State wins a lot. But if you were like, you know, what's going on at Ole Miss, be like, I don't know, Hugh Freeze is pretty good, right? Like they they, they pay that little attention. But if you bring up the Memphis Tigers. But, but they want to have a conversation about the Memphis Tigers because that's their hometown. That makes and sense. They want, and they're not even real fans. They'll pay for it. And what comes along in all those cities is not just lots of people, lots of money. Okay? When you get into SEC country, we got a lot of SEC fans. SEC fans are broke. We have a lot of that's poor true. states. We have poor states in all the country. That, yeah, and they, but we spend money on stupid stuff. We, we, and no, this would be I'm one not, thing. I'm not saying money they for. won't pay for it. I'm not saying they won't support it because the fans are rabid and they and they absolutely care and it's important to them. But I'm telling you, you're talking about these cities, ten bucks a month for what for for the yeah I'm gonna watch the UConn games. You live in Connecticut, you make like three hundred grand a year, and you're living middle class because it's so high a cost of living. What's ten bucks a month is nothing. You're gonna I'm with you. you're you're graduated from UConn or you know somebody who did and you're gonna get it. Okay. Because I, you're not just going to get football. It's going to be the whole thing. So all the people that support UConn basketball are going to buy in. That's all true. All the people that support Memphis basketball are going to be in. So everything comes along with it. I am I am curious. I'm curious to see how it's going to work but out. But I definitely think the first I, the first conference to stream will will blow away the numbers when that 10-year deal is over. Because it's going to be cheap at first. It's just like Netflix. You get everybody in, you get them real, real cheap, and then every year you bump it up a couple of dollars, and nobody cares, and everybody keeps paying it. Because they, they love the content because, that they're Because getting. they love the content they're getting. They're glad to pay it. But you make it cheap at first because you got to work kinks out, you got to work bugs out, you know you're going to have server issues in the middle of a game and people are going to be pissed. It's going to happen. But it's just one of those things where – I, it will I, be better long term. I than firmly any believe other that regular TV is going the way of the dinosaurs, and in ten years, I think all these guys are going to have contracts that are going to be streaming related. I think you're probably right. You're probably right. All right, that's going to wrap it up. You guys know what to do. WinningCuresEverything.com. Go check it out. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher. Uh, there's a new Google Podcast out. So if you've got an Android, download the Google Podcast app. We are on there. Uh, download, subscribe, review, five star reviews, written reviews. Knock that thing out. Every twenty five that we get, we are donating twenty five bucks to uh, St. Jude and or Labonner. So we did St. Jude the first time. We'll do Labonner the second time. Um, what else do we need to to hit today? Follows on YouTube as well. Oh yeah, that's a big thing. YouTube. You, YouTube's our new thing. YouTube.com slash Winning Cures Everything. I subscribe over it, there. But it's good. Uh, leave comments, all that wonderful stuff, and of course, as always, mybookie.ag promo code WCE50 fifty percent deposit bonus, which means you drop in fifty bucks, they're gonna give you twenty five. You drop in a hundred bucks, they're gonna give you fifty bucks. You get free money. There's nothing better in the world than free money. So, as always, follow us on Twitter, at Winning Cures. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Winning Cures. Everything, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, whatever, YouTube, all the wonderful things. But for now, we're gone. Y'all have a good week. It's time for the rundown. 
Remember, check out winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at Gary WCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, that's winningcureseverything at gmail.com. And we now have a voicemail line. That number is 551-226-9899. If you want to call and bash us for talking bad about your favorite team, or praise us, or just tell us about how awesome your team is doing, leave us a voicemail. That number again is 551-226-9899, and we may toss it on the show. Thank you for supporting this show, and until next time, have a good one, guys. Hey, don't forget, subscribe to the Winning Cures Everything podcast on iTunes and make sure you leave a review. For every 25 written five-star reviews we get on iTunes, we are donating to St. Jude's Children's Hospital and Le Bonheur's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So subscribe and review on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all your favorite podcast apps. Remember, the Winning Cures Everything podcast.